This episode is brought to you by my free three-part video series, FAM 101. Discover how to chart your cycles by tracking the three main fertile signs, cervical mucus, basal body temperature, and cervical position, and ultimately develop body literacy by paying attention to your fertile signs. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash FAM 101 to grab your free copy. That's fertilityfriday.com slash FAM 101. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 212. Welcome to the 212th episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm excited to share today's interview with you. So in today's episode, I'm also, so last week uh, I brought back a repeat guest. So last week we had Amy on the show. And Amy was one of my very first guests. And this week, I'm actually interviewing Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride once again. So for those of you who had the opportunity to delve into the hundreds of (laughs) archived episodes, I first interviewed Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride a couple of years ago. And I think our episode was either number 66 or 69, but it's in the 60s. If you haven't listened to that one, you'll want to go check it out. Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride is an incredible wealth of information, especially about gut health and how it relates to your overall health. And so in the first interview, we talked specifically about the GAPS diet, so gut and psychology syndrome. And that episode was really fascinating. I've had a number of clients kind of refer back to that episode regularly and listen to it a couple of times. It's definitely one (laughs) to listen to like twice to, to make sure you caught everything that you might not have caught the first time. And this episode isn't any different in the sense that you may have to actually listen to it twice. So in today's episode, we're talking about a different topic though, because Dr. Natasha recently wrote a book about vegetarianism. Her book is called Vegetarianism Explained. And so in today's episode, Dr. Natasha really takes us through the difference between these types of diets and what she feels is the function of a vegetarian diet. It may be different to what we've, the way that we've been taught about diet. So it's a really interesting perspective. You know, Dr. Natasha talks to us about the concept of fasting and that some of these diets that take out, take out animal products completely can actually be looked at as a form of fasting. So just a really fascinating take on it. And also to, to really give a little bit of texture to the conversation. I know on this podcast, I've done a number of episodes about uh, vegetarianism and veganism where they've come up on the show and they are always the most contentious episodes of the podcast. (laughs) If I'm going to get emails and comments, it's going to be on those videos. And part of it is because since I'm focused on fertility and menstrual cycle health, and what I, the information that I share is, is really based on my knowledge, my experience, also the guests, their knowledge, their experience, and also, you know, what the scientific research has to say, like, how do you optimize a menstrual cycle? Like, how do you optimize fertility for conception? What does the research tell us are the nutrients that we need to build a healthy baby? What, is, what does the research tell us are the nutrients that we need to have a healthy menstrual cycle and have healthy balanced hormones and those types of things? And fortunately or unfortunately, the research doesn't support a diet that has absolutely no meat products in it or no animal fats. And so it's it's a it's a complicated kind of contentious topic that I try to tread lightly about, but at the same time when I'm supporting women to optimize their menstrual cycles and we're looking at the charts, one of the questions that you always have to ask, especially if you've tried everything else and nothing is moving, you do have to at some point ask yourself, like, could the food that I'm eating play a role? And that that's that's kind of across the board, regardless of any dietary restrictions. And so that is why I invited Dr. Uh, Natasha back on the show, because I find the topic of her book and the way that she explains it just to be absolutely fascinating. And I would say the majority of my clients, they come to me, of course, because they want to learn how to chart their cycles. So they want to learn to chart. They want to learn how to understand cervical mucus observations. They think that's the thing I hear the most, like the the mucus doesn't make sense. I want to understand the mucus. And then the cervical position kind of comes shortly after that. But what happens is that once we really get a handle on the mucus charting, once we get to a standardized system of charting such that you can really understand what's happening, the next phase of it come, is a bit different because we first start by standardizing everything, getting really clear on the mucus observations. But then 
it allows us to clearly see what's happening in your charts. <laughs> so the first part is to get it all clear. And then the second part is to look at it. And so when you start looking at it, then you start to see some of the challenges that arise and some of the patterns that you're seeing on your chart, some of the, the different parameters and things that could indicate that there's something more happening, like there's an underlying challenge. And I feel like that is ultimately the heart of what I address in my client work. And so although registration is currently closed for the 10 week program, so that I, I'm not sure exactly, I haven't picked a date exactly for when uh, the next program is gonna be opening. But if you're looking for that personalized support, my one-on-one program, my one-on-one coaching program, it's a four month program where we meet every other week. So that is always open and available. So for information about that, if you're really wanting support at this stage, head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me for more information about that. And with that said, let us jump into today's episode with Dr. Natasha. And in today's show, I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, back to the show. Dr. Natasha is a medical doctor who graduated in Russia, and after practicing for five years as a neurologist and three years as a neurosurgeon, she started a family and moved to the UK, where she got her second postgraduate degree in human nutrition. She is well known for developing the concept of GAP, gut and psychology syndrome, which she described in her book, Gut and Psychology Syndrome, Natural Treatment for Autism. And in, you know, if you are, if you've heard of the GAPS diet, or if you're interested to hear more about that, in my first interview with Dr. Natasha back in episode number 66, we really delved into that. And that's one of my most popular episodes. That's one of the episodes that it's been downloaded (laughs) the most. So I'm thrilled to have Dr. Natasha back here with us today to talk about her newest book, Vegetarianism Explained. So without further ado, welcome back to the show, Dr. Natasha. Thank you very much for inviting me again. Well, I'm really... I enjoyed your show. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm really happy to have you back. And, you know, in the first interview, I think we went into a little bit more of your history and details. So I think the listener can kind of refer back to that. But I wanted to jump right in and, you know, the topic of the day, your new book, Vegetarianism Explained. What prompted you to write this book? at this time? In my GAPS work in my clinic, I started getting uh, lots and lots of anorexic girls. There were a few boys too, uh, but majority of sufferers of anorexia are girls, are young ladies. And uh, what I've discovered very quickly that a very large percent of these girls became ill because of vegetarianism, because of misguided stage of vegetarianism and veganism in their life. And that prompted an intense study into this subject. And quite quickly, I was dismayed to find out that there is no solid research done in this area. None. None that we can trust. There are a few studies which have been funded by vegetarians or pro-vegetarian people. And all of them are either incorrectly designed or incorrectly conducted or data has been incorrectly analyzed. So those studies I found are not to be trusted at all. So we don't really have any science to rely upon in this area. And this absence of science is confronted by a very evangelical vegetarian, pro-vegetarian propaganda that is getting stronger and stronger all over the world. And this propaganda is based on emotions, based on some political ideas from people, based on, generally speaking, based on ignorance, I have to say. So having done the study in this area and having spoken to many other doctors who work with these kind of patients, I have come to the conclusion that there is enough science in the basic physiology, there is enough clinical experience that we have accumulated to compile all of that and write a book about this, to explain, because there is nothing on the market which actually explains how animal foods work in the human body, how plants work in the human body, and what's the difference between the two. There is just this very emotional and very enthusiastic uh, propaganda going on that is not based on any science. Mm -hmm. So what I have discovered is that animal foods and plant foods are handled by the human body very, very differently. And that is uh, very important for us to understand. All energy on our beautiful planet is recycled. Apart from the energy of the sun, that's the new energy coming to the planet. In order to capture that energy of the sun, Mother Nature created plants. They have photosynthesis, 
They capture the sunlight and convert it into solid matter that we can touch and we can eat. They have photosynthesis. In order then for something else to consume the sunlight in the form of plants, Mother Nature created herbivorous animals. The cows, the goats, the camels, deer, and all the other herbivorous animals. And in order for these animals to be able to digest all the grass that they eat, all the plant matter that they eat, Mother Nature equipped them with a very special digestive system called rumen. A cow has huge four stomachs full of microbes. And it is these microbes that digest the grass for her. It's not her body that's digesting all the plants that she eats. It's those microbes. Because the solid fact that we have from um, biochemistry and physiology is that nothing on this planet can really digest plants apart from microbes. Only microbes are really able to break down the tough fiber, to break down starch, to cleave off proteins, to break down uh, plant proteins, and to make the plant matter into something digestible for other creatures on this planet. And that's, that fact was used by the Mother Nature to create the digestive system of herbivorous animals. Very, very special digestive system. And the rumen in the cow is full of bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, worms, flukes, all kinds of creatures, all living together. And it's these creatures that digest the plant matter for the cow. And the interesting things, more than 70% of all the sugars that the cow consumes in the form of plants are converted into short-chain fatty acids, which are fully saturated fatty acids. So herbivorous animals actually live on a very high-fat diet because all the sugars that they consume, about 70% of them is absorbed as saturated fat uh, into their bloodstream. In order then for something else to consume the sunlight on our planet in the form of herbivorous animals, Mother Nature created another group of creatures on the planet, predators and omnivores. And that's the group where we belong, the human beings. We don't have a rumen. We have a very small stomach. And if that stomach is healthy, it is virtually sterile inside. It has virtually no microbes living in it because it produces hydrochloric acid. And when we get hungry before meals, the acidity in the human stomach can go below two, sometimes even below one, which is a very, very acid environment for any kind of microbe to survive. And the only things that hydrochloric acid and pepsin and some other substances that human stomach produces, the only things that they can break apart and digest are meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. These are the things that are easy for the human stomach to break apart and to digest. Plants are indigestible for the human digestive system. They sit in the stomach and they wait for their turn. Uh, if we chew them well, then some of it might be digested a little bit, but majority of people don't chew their food um, very long. So the plants just sit in the stomach waiting for their turn, and then the whole mixture gets passed into several meters of intestines, and that is where the absorption of food happens. So the only things that can really be absorbed in the intestines is what digested properly, higher up in the stomach. And that is meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Plants, again, don't digest very well. They haven't been digested in the stomach and the intestines, all they can give out for us to absorb are vitamin C, vitamin K1, some juices, some phytonutrients and cleansing substances. But the plant protein is indigestible and the starch, most of it is indigestible and the structure of the plant, which is uh, largely cellulose, is absolutely indigestible for the human digestive system. And then all this mass goes through the intestines and the absorption of the food happens there to feed the body. And then the plants land in the bowel. And that is the equivalent of rumen in us humans. That's where the majority of our gut flora lives. That's where majority of our bacteria and viruses and fungi and pro protozoa and worms and flukes and the rest of them live. And they would work on the plant matter there and they will convert some sugars and starch into short chain fatty acids. The same way it happens in the cow, the saturated fat, to sustain us between the meals a little bit. The problem is, in a cow, her rumen is at the beginning of her digestive system, where the food gets properly digested, broken down, and then it moves into intestine where the absorption happens. 
In the human being, our equivalent of the rumen is at the end of the digestive system. It's too late to absorb. All the absorption has already happened higher up. So plants really cannot feed us to any degree. They are not feeding foods for the human body. They are only feeding building foods for our human physical structure for our heavy bones and big heavy muscles and our big heart and big lungs and big liver and big brain. The only foods that really feed and build our physical structure of the human body are meat, fish, eggs and dairy. That is just one aspect of it. Another aspect is when you take the human body and remove water from it, because about 70% of human body is water, the rest of it, the dry weight, is about 50-50, protein and fat. And when we analyze the structure of human protein from, from our human bodies in a laboratory, the amino acid um, structure of the protein, we find that in its amino acid composition, our proteins are very similar to proteins in meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. So it is quite easy for our digestive system to digest those foods break the proteins apart into amino acids, they absorb, and then it's very easy for the human body to build its own proteins out of those proteins from the animal foods. The same with the fats. Fat is about 50% of dry weight of your body is fat. Fat is a structural element, absolutely essential structural element. Your heart is sitting in a big chamber of thick fat. This is your heart's energy reserves because your heart muscle almost exclusively uses fat for energy production, for, for all its uh, relentless work that it's doing. Your kidneys are sitting in a thick layer of fat. Your liver, your, your intestines, all the inner organs, they, they sit in a casing of thick fat. And when we analyze the biochemical structure of that fat, we find that it is very similar to lamb fat, beef fat, pork fat, chicken fat, cream, and butter. So it is very easy for the human body to just convert those fats from the animal foods to our own fat to our own structure. What we need to understand also that human body is not static. It is constantly renewing itself and rejuvenating itself because all cells in the human body only live a short life. They get old, they get worn out, they work very hard and they die and they get shed off by the body. And then the body gives birth to a baby cell to replace those old worn out cells. This process is called cell regeneration or cell turnover in the human body. Trillions of baby cells are born in the human body every day, in your brain, in your heart, in your muscles, in your bones, in your bone marrow, in every organ, trillions of cells. In order for the body to give birth to all those baby cells, building materials are required. And again, these cells remove 70% water, they're half and half protein and fat. And you have to have the right kind of protein and the right kind of fat to build those cells. That's how human body heals itself, rejuvenates itself, and perpetuates its existence on the planet by giving birth to baby cells. So the only foods that really can feed this cell regeneration process, this cell turnover process, are meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. When we look at plants, plants are full of protein, Yes, they've got proteins. Gluten is a good example, one of the examples of proteins in plants. First of all, they're indigestible. And the more we're researching gluten, the more we're realizing nobody can digest it. Even people who, on the face of it, don't have any symptoms when they eat gluten, it's still damaging their bodies it, because it is indigestible for the human body. And when we analyze the biochemical structure of plant proteins, we find that their amino acid composition is inappropriate for human physiology. Some amino acids are missing, other amino acids are in excess, and the whole amino acid profile does not, is not compatible with the human body. So not only these proteins are indigestible for the human digestive system, they also are inappropriate. They, they're unable to build our physical structure, the physical body, and to feed the cell regeneration process. The same with fats. Plants have fats in them, they have oils in them. When we analyze the biochemical structure of those oils in the laboratory, we find that they are inappropriate, incompatible with the human fats, with the fats that your body is made from. Certain fatty acids are missing, other fatty acids are in excess, and we need these fats, we need plant oils, but we need them in tiny amounts every day. So just eating fruit and vegetables and eating a handful of nuts every day will provide enough 
of those omega fats that your body might need. But the bulk, more than 90% of all fats that you consume on a daily basis, have to come from animal foods, from meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Because these are the fats which are very compatible with building your own human fats that your body is made from. And it's the easiest thing for the human body to convert into your bodily fats. So these are solid scientific facts that we have from basic biochemistry and basic physiology and basic uh, medicine that have been researched for a very long time. And of course, majority of vegetarians and vegans in the world do not have this information. They do not know this. Um, there's all kinds of myths going around. And our nutritional science is busy producing misinformation. You know, we, will, we live in a world of uh, mis scientific misinformation pumped onto the population relentlessly. And, you know, if you, if you look at the all this misinformation that is being poured on the population, it's all about fats are bad for you, fats are bad, fats, fats are bad for you, uh, meat is bad for you, meat is bad for you, meat is bad for you, eggs are bad for you, eggs are bad for you, eggs are bad for you, and, and, and so on. And this is all commercial propaganda. It has nothing to do with the truth and with the reality. Well, I want to so talk that's about the, some of the, so you really kind of, went through and de like demythified a lot of these things. As someone who lives in kind of North American society, there's a lot of things, like when you describe it that way, you know, Dr. Natasha, when you describe the kind of compatibility issue, like we're more similar to animals, like it makes sense from that perspective. It kind of like, okay, well, yeah, our fat, the fats in our body, yeah, they would be more like animal fats and, you know, all of those, like it makes logical sense to think about it, but Many of the listeners and, you know, even myself included, I've grown up in a time where I've heard people flat out say human beings are herbivores. So I really appreciate that you went through and described the the rumen because, I, you know, cows have this extraordinary four stomach situation. And I'm pretty sure that it takes them hours and hours and many. It's not even like in order to for them, in order for a cow who's designed to eat grass and plants in order for them to digest it, it it's, it's something that takes hours and they have to kind of chew the same food over and over again. But we've heard that, like I've heard people say we're herbivores, we're more similar to herbivores. I've heard people say that meat is di more difficult to digest. Meat causes cancer. Not at all. Jack is, um, Jack is the, old, <laughs> the opposite. Yes. And so, yeah, that's just meat something I wanted to bring to your... Digest. Because that's what we're that's what we're being told. We're being told that meat causes cancer. We're being told that meat is more difficult to digest. We're being told that our body is more suited to eat plants. That's the information that's being told to us these days. That is the propaganda that is is has been pumped on the population starting from 1953, when the diet heart hypothesis was born, which suggested that it's animal fats and cholesterol that cause heart disease. And now the science has spoken conclusively and, and has been speaking for the last 20 years that that hypothesis is entirely wrong. In fact, animal fats, meat and, and animal fats and cholesterol prevent heart disease and are essential to actually not fall prey to this disease. I've described this subject in detail in my uh, previous book called Put Your Heart in Your Mouth, what really causes heart disease and what we can do to prevent and even reverse it. So if any of you are interested in that subject, please read that book. It will explain it to you in detail. And it is fully referenced for the professionals who need the references. But it is written in an easy-to-understand language for those who are not scientifically minded. But coming back to the vegetarianism. So based on all of this, we have to understand it is possible to be a healthy vegetarian. But you have to keep some animal foods in your diet to feed and build your body. Because animal foods are the feeding building foods for the human body. So what are the plants for? The plants, why do we eat them in, at all, the plants? Plants cannot build your body to any degree. They can't feed you. They're not feeding foods for you. But they have powerful cleansing substances in them. They have phenols, salicylates, phytonutrients, vitamins, minerals, and, and other things, which are very powerful and very good at keeping your body clean on the inside. That's why... It is important for us to be well-fed, and it is important for us to be clean on the inside. That's why we eat both the plants and the animal foods. And from both kingdoms, it is important to have some. Such vegetarian cultures exist in India and exist in some other countries in the world. And those people are vegetarians not by choice, but by necessity. 
because of the environment that they live in. India has always been a very highly populated country. In fact, it's got, got 2.4 billion people in India. It is the most populated country in the world, India. If you go to India, and I've been there, people are everywhere. And if these people start eating their animals, they will probably eat them all in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They, they'll, they'll just kill them all in, in two weeks. So vegetarians for them is a necessity. It is out of, not, not out of choice. Why do you think in India the cow is a sacred animal? Cows are wandering everywhere and a cow can be standing in the middle of a motorway in India. And nobody has the right to shoo her away. They carefully drive around her. <laughs> she's, she's, she's got the right, you see, she's got more rights than the humans. Because through centuries, through experience, people in India learned that without the cow they would die. She provides them with the most essential part of their diet, with milk, cream, butter, ghee, cheese. That's an animal protein, animal fat that sustains their human bodies. Another food that these vegetarians eat in abundance are eggs. They have chickens and they have ducks and value their eggs very much. And many people who, uh, keep goats and also value their milk very much. People in India who live along the coasts and along the rivers, fish is their staple. They eat a lot of seafood. They eat a lot of fish. They fish every day, and that is the most important food for them. And they have fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it is the most valued bit of food on their plate, if you speak to these traditional people. So it is possible to be a healthy vegetarian, but you have to keep some animal foods in your diet in order to sustain your body, to sustain your physical structure. So veganism, a purely plant-based approach, is not a diet. It is a form of fasting. I have a chapter on fasting. In, in this new book, Vegetarianism Explained. There are many various forms of fasting, and fasting is as old as the hills. It is, I do recommend it for some people. And for people who have accumulated a lot of toxicity in their bodies, it is a good idea to fast for a period of time. The most basic fasting is just drinking water and eating nothing. And of course, every human being with any sense would understand that you can't do that forever. Can you? <laughs> you can't just live on water forever, right? Now, veganism is also a form of fast. And just like a, a water fast, you cannot live on veganism forever. You simply cannot. What happens in this bit is a good idea for some people who are very toxic to follow a vegan approach for a week or two, maximum two months. But at certain point, and, and initially, you have a lot of books, very enthusiastic, written by people who started this kind of vegan fast and how well they felt. Because a cleaner body always feels better than a toxic one. Without doubt, many symptoms disappear when you eat only vegan foods and because you're cleansing, 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 cleansing. But at a certain point, your body will finish cleansing and it will become hungry. It will give you a signal. I'm hungry now. Feed me, please. The way it would give you that signal, it will give you a desire for a steak or for a big piece of cheese or for a pot of cream or some other animal, or eggs, or some, animal, some other animal food. The problem with our modern vegans in the Western world is that many of them are doing this for emotional reasons, political reasons, religious reasons, and other um, reasons, and they override that signal from their body. They do not listen to their body. And that's the moment when the body starts cannibalizing itself and starts deteriorating, and people fall into illness. Anorexia nervosa is a direct result of that, other mental illnesses follow. In fact, I'm coming to the conclusion and other holistic doctors that I speak to and work with have come to the same conclusion as well that misguided veganism is becoming uh, rapidly becoming a major cause of mental illness amongst our young people in the Western world because there is just so much misinformation in this area. And not only mental illness, but digestive problems, immune problems, autoimmune disease, and physical other physical chronic illnesses follow. Because the body, when it's hungry and it's starving, because on a vegan uh, fast you're starving, basically you're not feeding your body to any degree, you're cleansing, cleansing. In order to feed the most vital organs, such as the brain and the heart and the lungs, the body will start cannibalizing the muscle and the bones and other less essential organs. And so you start losing your muscle mass and you'll start losing other tissues in the body and you start falling into the disease. 
Many people uh, follow this approach and, and, and decide to follow this approach after they learn how our industrial agriculture treats animals and birds, which is absolutely appalling, absolutely appalling. And nobody should support that. And nobody should really buy their produce. Because Mother Nature created animals and birds to live under the sunlight on pasture. Chickens need to be on pasture because chickens eat a lot of grass. And they dig for worms and grubs and insects. And that is their meat. Chickens eat a lot of meat. They're, carniv they're carnivorous. They're omnivores, just like us. They've got a very similar digestive system. And they need a lot of meat and they need a lot of grass. And it is from the grass, from the carotenoids and the grass, that the yellow color comes in the yolk in the egg yolk. What our industrial agriculture has done, it's taken the chickens off the pasture, locked them up in prisons, in CAFOs, these confined factory operations. And of course, they're not getting any grass, these chickens. As a result, their egg yolks become very, very pale. So the commercial feed that is given to these chickens has a dye, a yellow dye added, a synthetic yellow paint added into it to make the yolks yellow or orange. The same was done to the cows and to the pigs and to the sheep and, and to other farm animals. They all locked up in these factory operations and they given synthetic food, genetically modified foods inappropriate for their physiology because grain is not the right food for the cows and sheep and pigs. Grass is. Cows are supposed to eat grass on pasture and it's supposed to be natural organic pasture, not only with one hybrid monoculture of a grass seeded by a farmer and then sprayed with chemicals and fed with chemicals. No, it should have about 40, 50 different species of grasses and herbs in it, growing in a community. And that's the only kind of pasture that will sustain a healthy population of cows and a happy population of cows. And when these animals are under the sunlight, vitamin D is produced in their skin. And then that vitamin D goes into their meat and into their milk and into their eggs. And from those foods, we get the vitamin D in abundance for our bodies to use and many, many other nutrients. That's the only way to get a real quality. So you don't have to buy your meat, fish and eggs from a commercial farmer in a supermarket. In fact, supermarket is the worst place to buy your food. I do not recommend my patients to buy food from the supermarkets. Our industrial agriculture will tell you that they are the ones that feed the world. That is not true. 75% of the world is fed by small organic farms and allotments and small holdings. That is the scientific fact, and it is online if you, if you want to research that. So even, of course, majority of these small farms are in places like India and Africa and other third world countries. But even the Western world has hundreds and hundreds of organic farms where the farmer has happy and healthy animals and birds living on pasture under the sunlight, in the environments that Mother Nature designed them to live in. Find these farms locally. The best way to do it is to go to your local farmer's market and talk to the farmers and take their address details and go and visit them, make friends with them, and buy their food exclusively. Many farmers deliver. They will deliver to your house. And when you buy directly from the farmer, you're cutting out all the middlemen, so the food will be less expensive for you, and you'll be getting quality. And you can go and visit these animals and you will see that they are happy animals. So you'll be getting happy meat and happy milk and happy eggs because the emotions of the animal, they do predetermine the hormonal balance in the body of the animal. And that predetermines the composition of the meat and fish and, and of the meat and eggs and, and milk that we, we get from these animals. So their emotions are important, very, very important how they grow. So why are the animals have, have been taken off pasture by our industrial agriculture? Because they want to plow every square meter of the land and grow plants on it. And why do they want to do that? Because the government subsidizes the growth of commercial crops in the Western world. And what do farmers grow largely here in, in Britain? It is a rotation of wheat, sugar beet, and rapeseed. Flour, sugar, and vegetable oil. The three legs that every degenerative disease stands on in the population. And of course, the government subsidized those farmers heavily to grow just these three crops. In America, they also grow, and in, in, in warmer climates, they, they grow um, soya. 95% of all soy production in the world is genetically modified. And they grow cotton and they grow some other things. They grow plants. 
why does our industrial agriculture wants to plow every square meter? And it's so precious for them to have this land plowed and plowed and plowed all of it. And so the animals have to be taken off the land. Because for a commercial agriculture, it is easy to grow plants. Our agricultural science has been working for decades and they worked out these schemes and the machinery is right there. So the farmer is told now on day one, you spray this. On day five, you spray that. On day 14, you spray this. And he's a machine for this and he's a machine for that and he's a machine for the other. And it works. It produces the yield for these farmers of this verdant greenery, of this nice looking produce. What's inside that produce, nobody wants to know and nobody's really measuring. Nobody's even looking at it. The governments are not interested. The fact that this produce has a very low nutritional value and is full of chemicals, nobody's interested. But it is the yield that they're interested because yield translates into money, it translates into profit. When it comes to looking after animals, animal husbandry, it is very hard for the commercial agriculture to do. Very, very hard. Because the animals are miserable. It is a miserable occupation for the farmer. And if you walk into any of those farms, the first thing you will see are rows and rows of fridges full of pharmaceutical drugs. Because these animals, because they live in, a, in an unnatural, unnatural synthetic environment, they're all sick. They're all ill. They drop dead every day, these animals. They can't survive without antibiotics, steroids, and other drugs. On a daily basis, it's added into their feed, routinely. They're all on pharmaceuticals, these drugs. And the veterinary profession is all over them, these farmers, and the government is all over them with its regulations, and the losses are very high. So animal husbandry is difficult for industrial agriculture. While growing plants is easy peasy for them. So they want to grow plants to feed all those vegetarians. Where at the same time, what the commercial agriculture is doing is destroying the soil. Because every time we plow the soil, every time we spray chemicals on it, we destroy it. Soil on our planet is the most precious commodity and we're losing it at a very rapid, very alarming rate. All life on Earth begins with soil, begins in the soil, and finishes up in the soil. It is quite a thin layer around our beautiful planet, and all life begins in it. Without soil, there will be no life on Earth. Industrial agriculture, growing all those plants for our vegetarians, is destroying soil at an alarming rate. Majority of fields in the Western world are deserts now. A healthy soil is a microbial community. It's alive. It's full of bacteria, viruses, fungi, insects, caterpillars, worms, you know, all kinds of little creatures. They all live together. And what they do, these microbes, they create a substance called humus. Humus is a polymer made out of carbon. It is almost pure carbon. And once carbon has been converted into humus, it will stay in the soil for hundreds of years. It is a carbon that is locked up in the soil. Every time our big machinery plows the soil and sprays it with chemicals, the microbial community is killed in there and humus gets dissolved, turned into carbon dioxide and it goes into the atmosphere. It is an absolute scientific fact that our industrial arable agriculture is the number one cause of global warming on the planet. They are releasing the biggest reservoir of carbon on the planet into the atmosphere every time that machine goes across that arable field to grow all those plants for us humans to eat. Well, and so when you being, become a veg- We're being yeah. taught that, so, because, you know, I've watched some of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of very powerful propaganda. As you said, there's a lot of very powerful documentaries. And those documentaries are intended to convince us that the biggest problem in terms of global warming is the manufacture of cattle. And so then, of course, the solution being going vegetarian. And so, I, you know, I think that it's important to touch on that a little bit. But also there's something that you talk about in your book. You've touched on it a bit, like the different role that plant foods and animal foods play. So for someone who's listening, you know, I'm always thinking about what the audience might be thinking about. And there's a lot of information out there that would tell, like, having these types of conversations, I've heard a lot of things. And one of the things is that, okay, we don't need to eat cholesterol. You know, we don't, our body can make it so we don't need to eat it. So there's a lot of information out there saying that we don't need it. I know you mentioned that, you know, vegetarian veganism, you mentioned a link between that. And you mentioned mental illness, you mentioned immune 
issues and different challenges in that that nature. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more just about the role. Like, why do we, because I think the other thing is that we're taught that we need animal food or we need plant foods for our vitamins and minerals. And growing up, I actually thought that that was where the majority of my vitamins and micronutrients came from. I thought that we get it all from plants. And I remember wondering, because I live in Canada, it's very cold here. <laughs> and, you know, we are able to l- survive here because of our technology. If I didn't have my nice warm house and all that stuff, like I don't, honestly, I think about this a lot because it gets really cold here. And I've often wondered, you know, people lived on these planes out here in Canada for years before all of this modern technology. And, you know, they didn't have access to all of these fresh vegetables all winter long. So I've often wondered, like, what did they do? Anyway, so I, I just wanted to touch on that a little bit because I feel like there's a lot of information that we're being taught. A lot of the audience members, we've all heard all of this information that it's cows that are the leading source of global warming and it's vegetables that we need to get all our minerals from and, and you know, all of those things. So I'll throw it back to you. <laughs> this, this propaganda about cows belching methane and causing global warming is such a nonsense that it doesn't even deserve a response because it's it's an absolute scientific impossibility. This idea was proposed once by some agri- agrochemical company at one of the summits in the European community, and it was so laughable that it was immediately closed, that report, and it wasn't even... But who got hold of it? Media. Who do you think in this world is behind the pro-vegetarian propaganda? I have no doubt that it is the industrial agrochemical complex because it is within their interests, their commercial interests, to turn large proportions of the human population on the planet to vegetarianism. The more vegetarians we have in the world, the more plants they eat, the more plants will be required, so the more profits will be for the arable industrial complex. More land will need to be plowed, more machinery will need to be produced, more chemicals will need to be manufactured, more genetically modified seed will need to be manufactured, another seed will be need to be manufactured. There is no doubt it is an industrial, arable, chemical complex that is behind pro-vegetarian propaganda. So if you want to help, you know, the, the one, of the, one of the slogans that they give, that vegetarianism is kind to the planet and kind to animals and kind to the land and kind to humans, none of those statements are true. The opposite is true. Because the only way to supply hordes of vegetarians with all the plant matter they want to eat is through arable industrial agriculture. In an, in, a, in an organic garden, you can't produce enough plant matter to feed even one vegetarian for a year. Because remember I said to you that growing plants for the industrial Agriculture is easy, while looking after animals is difficult. When we go into the organic, natural farming, these two things swap completely. Looking after animals and birds is easy, easy peasy. I'm a farmer myself. Five years ago, my family bought a farm. It was a a steep learning curve, and we have all the animals and birds and gardens and fruit and orchards and the rest of it. We've learned a lot. So now I can not only speak from the experience of other people, I can speak from a personal experience. Looking after animals, cows, sheep, goats, pigs, chickens, easy. You let them out in the morning, you give them some food, and you lock them up at night and you give them some food. The rest of the day is free for you. All you have to do is provide them with a natural, proper environment, with pasture, with proper environment to free range, to get, and they get their own food. That's how Mother Nature designed them. However, growing organic vegetables and fruit is the hardest thing to do on an organic farm. It is so hard. You can, first of all, there's a huge amount of knowledge that you have to have in order to achieve that. Mother Nature just doesn't want us to grow vegetables. (laughs) That's, That's the conclusion you come to. You can do everything by the book. You can do everything you possibly could learn to do. But then the weather's not right and the sun shines at the wrong time and it rains at the wrong time and the pests come from nowhere. And then the rabbits and the deer get to your produce and the birds get to your produce. The yield is unpredictable. You cannot guarantee yield on a proper natural organic farm. 
the organics that we've developed in the last 10 years, industrial commercial organic farms, because the industrial agrochemical complex wanted a piece of that pie, you know, organic producers becoming more and more popular, and they have diluted, corrupted the organic standards. We now have organic pesticides and organic chemicals and other practices which have no place in a proper natural growth of, of produce. So I'm telling you the fact, and you ask any organic farmer or any person who actually has a good organic garden, it is not possible to produce enough plant matter to feed even one vegetarian for a year out of a private organic garden. The only way we can sustain a population of vegetarians and vegans is through industrial arable agriculture. Our vegetarians and vegans, all these evangelists, they're buying their food in supermarkets. Where's that food coming from? from industrial arable agriculture, including the organic, so-called organic stuff. You cannot trust it. There's a lot of cheating in that area. And as I say, organic standards have been diluted. That is the only way to sustain. And as our arable agriculture is growing all that plant matter for our vegetarian street, they are destroying the topsoil, releasing carbon into the atmosphere. All the chemicals that they're pouring on the land finish up in the groundwaters, in the, our rivers and streams and our ocean, destroying the population of wildlife and fish and amphibians. There is nothing kind to the planet and kind to animals in a vegetarian lifestyle. You are supporting industrial arable agriculture. That's all you're doing without realizing it. At the same time, because the soil is being destroyed, you know, hummus in a healthy soil this polymer hummus, it holds almost 100 times its weight in water. It's like a sponge. Every time it rains, it swells, and it holds all that water in the pasture, in the soil. These arable fields, they have been destroyed to such a degree, there is no hummus left in there at all. It's been all destroyed. Those fields cannot hold water. All the rains just run off there, causing floods in the villages and towns downstream. Floods in the Western world are getting more and more intense. And it isn't due to the fact that governments are not building new dams or, or whatever. You know, it, it is due to the industrial arable agriculture because the fields above that town and village have been plowed and have been destroyed. The, the, the structure of soil have been destroyed. So you don't have to support that agriculture. Find local farmers, support these organic farmers who do things properly. You'll be getting proper quality food. You can visit the animals. You can volunteer there. You can help these people. And the governments don't support organic farmers. In fact, they interfere with them all the time and make their lives difficult. That's what our government's for. So the only organic farmers, proper farmers who have mixed farms, the only farmers who survive are the ones who have a strong customer base of customers who come to the farm and buy from the farmer directly, not through middlemen, not through all these supermarkets who take the biggest cut in the profits where the farmer is paid pittance for their hard work. So support these farmers, allow them to survive because they are building the soil. And every time they have a pasture and they build the soil, they're capturing carbon out of the atmosphere and returning it back into the soil. In fact, pasture, pastured animals and cattle, there is a huge amount of research to show. I don't have time to go in depth into that. If you would Google Savory Institute and the work of Savory Institute, you will, you will understand all of that, that concept. It is the relationship of grasslands, pasture, and herds of herbivorous animals, cattle and sheep and, and antelope and other herbivorous animals that have probably created topsoil on our planet. Every time those herds graze and then come back again, they have to be on a rotation. You can't just lock them up in one place and leave them there. That destroys pasture. And that is a traditional way human beings have done it for hundreds of years, and they destroyed a lot of pastures. No, animals need to be moved on because in nature, in the savanna in Africa and other natural habitats, herds of herbivorous animals never eat in one place longer than for, for an hour, maybe. They keep moving on. And once they've eaten grass in one place and defecated and urinated to supplement the soil with bacteria, with microbes, with their gut flora, their ruminal flora, then they move on and they don't come back to that place for three, four months until the grass has regrown again. And all that matter, all their excrements and the roots of the grasses, they turn into hummus in those three, four months. So pulsing it like that, in, in a rotation like that, we build new layers of topsoil, proper topsoil, rich in hummus. And in order to build it, 
the soil grabs hold of carbon out of the atmosphere, the plants through photosynthesis grab, grab hold of it and return that carbon into the soil and turn it into the humus, into the polymer. So this process is so powerful that the scientists have already calculated that we can reverse global warming in a matter of a few years if we turn even a proportion of our arable fields back to pasture and take animals out of those horrible kafos and put them back on pasture. We can reverse global warming, not only stop it, not arrest the process, reverse it entirely, completely, 100%. There is a way of doing that. And the only way to do that is through herbivorous animals, because they are the creators of the soil and they are the, the animals on this planet who actually clean the air and reverse the global warming, far from causing it. You know, it, so, makes, it makes so much sense if you think of, like, from one perspective, it's a natural reaction when you see how horrible these animals are being treated in these feedlots and things like that. I know I had a very strong reaction ever since I've, you know, bore witness to that. I have never eaten the same way again after seeing exactly what happens and how these animals are treated and all that kind of stuff. I have never eaten that way again. So I've always sourced my food locally and all. it really made a fundamental impact on me. So it would seem as though this is kind of the knee-jerk reaction to how we've kind of gone so far off of the natural path with regards to our food production. But it sounds as though you're kind of calling us to actually, okay, we need to take a look at what's really going on here and see what we could really, like what's really going to make an impact on the world. When you learn just the relationship between herbivorous animals and pasture and the environment, it just makes so much more sense that that is the way that if we really, if we really care about the environment and if we really want to make a shift in the world, if we really want to reduce carbon emissions, it would seem as though that would be the best way to support our planet, to actually allow these animals to graze like they exactly. were. Yeah. Mother Nature is infinitely wiser than our sciences. <laughs> it has all the answers. It worked them out for billions of years, step by step, starting from the simplest thing and making it more and more complex. All the answers are in nature. We just have to observe how she does things and copy it. That would be the smartest things for our humans, for us humans to do. But of course, unfortunately, the Western world is run by commercial powers and their interests are very, very different. And Mother Nature is just a victim to them, to be destroyed. Well, and to kind of shift a little bit, one of the things that I hear a lot from people, especially nowadays, especially that people have these big platforms and anyone can, you know, jump out there and, and share their experience. So there's a lot of, you know, vegetarian and vegan bloggers who are, you know, putting up their experiences. And so there's a lot of people who will say, you know, I've been a vegan for 12 years and I'm completely fine and I had babies and everything's great. And so there's a lot of people that would say, well, no, obviously people can survive on a vegetarian vegan diet because, you know, this person has done it and this person has done it and they're totally fine. So how do you, what would you say to that? And how do you, basically what I'm asking is how can, what does the science have to say about what the body needs? And you know what I mean? Because you can say, okay, our body needs these things and the plants don't contain these these supportive nutrients, but you have a lot of people who are witnessing, you know, this bigger kind of growth of, you know, veganism, and vegetarianism. There's a lot of women who have written books about vegan pregnancies and how, you know, it's sustainable and we can do this and it's healthy and it's fine. So how do you address those types of, like, how do you address that question, basically? I have never met a healthy vegan, to be honest. And I have seen hundreds of very sick vegans. Very, very sick. I have met some healthy vegetarians, but these people uh, cook from scratch, and these people make sure that they eat plenty of dairy, high-fat dairy, and high quality, and plenty of eggs. And occasionally they would eat meat, and they will eat fish. Clearly, human beings are all different. We all have different constitution. We come from different hereditary. So different people need different proportions of animal foods to plants in their diet. If your predecessors come from Northern Europe, then chances are you do need to eat a lot of meat and fat. But if your predecessors came from some tropical area of the world, around the equator somewhere, then perhaps your constitution is you can survive on a lot of plant matter and just occasionally eat some animal foods to sustain, sustain yourself, to sustain your body. 
What happens with many vegans is their self-perception is altered. They are not perceiving what's going on in their bodies. I have met so many anorexic girls who do not believe that there's anything wrong with them. They look absolutely terrible. They look as if they're going to die any moment. They're absolutely convinced that they're absolutely healthy. And they exercise every day and they run miles and they drive themselves and they believe they need to lose more weight, despite the fact that they look absolutely terrible and, and that they're seriously, seriously underweight. The perception of self-perception of the person can suffer in these people. And also the brain is a high fat organ. It's made out of very high amount of fat and uh, protein, largely, and water. And the brain has a very active cell turnover as well. And what I find that in people who go into, into vegan fast, it should not be called a diet. It is not a diet. It doesn't feed the human body. Uh, who go on a vegan fast for a long period of time, that their brain matter shrinks. And the ability of the brain to actually perceive the situation re is reduced quite seriously. The first thing that disappears, a sense of humor disappears. <laughs> they become very, very black and white, these people. Generally speaking, I don't believe. And a woman who can sustain a pregnancy and manage to sustain it on a vegan protocol is basically converting her own tissues of her own body to build the baby's body. And if you search the internet, you will find court case after court case when a baby has been taken away from a vegan parent or vegan parents because the baby's life was in danger. Because the mother is, is so evangelical about her veganism that she has is damaging her baby. She's trying to keep the baby on a vegan regimen, which is very dangerous. Children not only need to feed their cell regeneration processes in the body, they're growing. They need to feed growth. Their bodies are growing. They need large amounts of animal fat and protein in order to build the physical structure of their bodies. I have seen, the, I have, I've never seen a vegan child that's grown up in a, in a vegan environment. I have seen children who grew up in a vegetarian environment. And obviously I run a clinic where healthy children don't come. So I have seen many vegetarian children with serious chronic illnesses. Well, and what is the link bet bet uh, with immune function? How does a vegetarian or vegan diet impact your ability to fight off illnesses and things like that? Yes, that's a very important question because our immune system is a very hungry organ. It needs feeding and it needs feeding with high quality protein and high quality fat all the time. And what happens in many vegans that I have seen, their immune system in such a state, it's unable to react. They all boast about that, oh, I never get colds. I never have temperatures. You know, everybody's got a cold around. I never have a cold. Well, I have seen many autistic children and schizophrenic individuals and people with autoimmunity in their bodies who also never have colds. When we put them on a GAPS nutritional protocol and their immune system gets off the floor and starts functioning, they develop a temperature. They develop their first cold in their life. Because the cold is not the virus that's causing the sneezing and the you know, runny nose and temperature and, and malaise and all the rest of it. It's your own immune system reacting to the virus and dealing with it, killing it, removing it, that is causing the temperature and the malaise and the runny nose and the headache and, and all the other symptoms. Your own immune system. If your immune system is on the floor and is unable to react to the virus, you will have no, none of those symptoms. But the viruses will still come into your body and settle in and do what they want to do. You will be developing chronic viral infections in your body while your immune system is unable to react to them, is unable to respond. Temperature is one of the major tools that our immune system uses for fighting things in the body. And there's a lot of research now into hypothermia. Induced hypothermia is now being used in the treatment of cancer, chronic fatigue syndrome, and other serious chronic illnesses because temperature is curative. It is very, very healing. It is one of the major tools of our immune system. When it launches temperature, the toxins are burnt out, cancers are destroyed, um, parasites are removed, infections are killed. All sorts of wonderful things happen in the body. Yes, temperature is very uncomfortable. It isn't a pleasant experience at all, but it is something that our bodies have to be allowed to use and to run, to run properly and to deal with the situation. Well, many vegans are unable to launch temperature. Their, their immune system is not in a fit state to do that. So they never have a temperature. They never have a runny nose. 
because the immune system is a no fit state to react. And I would put in that group autistic children and schizophrenic individuals and bipolar disorder patients and patients with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and diabetes type 1 and some other severe chronic mental and physical illnesses. Their immune system is also on the floor. It's unable to react. That is why these people never have colds and never have temperatures. Hmm. Well, I don't want to keep you too long because we're kind of at the end of our time here. I am curious as to what is it about then animal foods, like foods from animal sources? Why do we need it for immune function? And what is it that animal foods give us that we're not getting from plants that would strengthen our immune system? Well, your immune cells are the same like all other cells in the body. 70% of them is water. The rest, 50-50, is protein and fat. And the biochemical structure of that protein is similar to protein in the animal foods and is very, very different from the protein in plants. Plants cannot feed, cannot supply proper protein for your body. They cannot. You know, hydrolyzed pea protein or soy protein or the rest of it is inappropriate, entirely inappropriate. They will only cause illnesses in your body. The same with fat that the immune cells are made from because half of their dry weight is fat. Very important animal fats and cholesterol. Cholesterol is a major structural element of the human body. And again, they only can come from animal foods in the right biochemical structure. So the foods that really feed your immune system and make it strong and powerful to fight, the, uh, to deal with the environment are animal foods, not plants. Plants are cleansers. They do not feed human body. They cleanse us. All right. Well, you know, for more information, where can the listeners go to get a copy of your book? We, I feel like we've scratched the surface. I know that we could continue talking for two hours and we would still only scratch the surface because there's so much that you have to share with us. But Please yeah. read the book. <laughs> yes. it'll, it'll give you the full spectrum of information. I've written this book with young people in mind. That's why I put some nice pictures in there and <laughs> made, it, made it easy to digest and easy to understand because it is the youngsters, the teenagers that fall prey to pro-vegetarian propaganda largely in the world. And of course, they don't have the information. This book will give them information. It's easy to read. I deliberately made it easy to read. So if you know somebody who is considering a plant-based lifetime, give them my book to read. You might save a life. It is, you know, it never hurts to get the full spectrum of information before taking such an important step in your life. Make an informed decision rather than an emotional one. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask you what is the one thing you wanted the listeners to take away from this, but I feel like it might have been that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, share with us your website where we can go for information and where we can get the book. And of course, I will include those links in the show notes page. The website for Vegetarian Book is called VegetarianismExplained.com. Okay, well, thank you so much. One word, VegetarianismExplained.com. Perfect. Well, and I have a, a GAPS website, which is GAPS.me, but that focuses largely on the GAPS condition. And I have a blog, Dr-Natasha.com. Okay, well, we will link all of your websites so that our listeners can learn more. And I just want to thank you so much for being here on the show and for sharing your knowledge and information with us. I was saying to you before we started our recording, I'm just thankful that you're out there in the world educating. It's really incredible just to think about how far some of these opinions and different things are from the science. And it's really only when you look into the science that you kind of start to question what we're being told about healthy eating and all those things. So I really appreciate that you're out there in the world and really trying to educate us from that scientific perspective. Thank you. And thank you for your work as well, because you're spreading the word. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 212. I hope that you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Natasha. It is always a treat to have her on the show. You know, Dr. Natasha has this incredible energy about her. She's so passionate about what she does. And she has spent a lot of time, you know, reading, researching, supporting families. And, you know, in her practice, she's seen a lot of clients, a lot of patients who are, you know, incredibly sick based on you know, gut issues and, and different dietary restrictions that they've had and things like that. And so I think it's helpful to remember the perspective that everyone's coming from. 
after interviewing well over, I'm not sure the exact number, but well over 150 different guests over the years of the podcast, what really has stood out to me is how everyone's perspective is so is I mean it's just obvious common sense thing but everyone's perspective it's informed by their educational experience kind of like where what their background is but it's also heavily informed by what their experiences have been so what types of patients they've seen in their practice what types of treatments that they've seen work for people when they've seen certain conditions reverse or improve based on what they've done. And I could say I share a lot of that because I mean, on a, a bit of a lesser scale, but when I'm working with clients to to kind of see what's happening with their menstrual cycles, and then they'll make various changes. And then you'll see on their chart, like the cycle changes as well. It's those types of experiences that really inform what you do, like when you actually see people get better <laughs> based on different changes that they've made. And so I really appreciate Dr. Natasha for taking the time to come on the show and, and just telling us a little bit about her own experiences and her perspective and what the research has shown us about the different ways that diet can impact our health. And that is the part that I find really fascinating because in, in you know this day and age with the internet, there's so many different diets out there. There are anything you can imagine is out there. And there are always people who are willing to share their experiences and their stories. But the challenging part is that not all of those people have necessarily looked at any research, have not necessarily seen a lot of experiences outside of their own. Like I would always joke, like I'm an N of one. So whatever my experiences have been, that's just me. <laughs> and so although it's powerful to have your own experience, it doesn't generalize to everybody. And so I think that is something to keep in mind, especially when you're considering making a massive dietary change that involves literally cutting out like an entire food group. And I think it's really important to to not take that decision lightly and to really do your best to source great research to find out, like, how does this really affect people? And I think especially with respect to fertility, because you as the listener of the podcast are listening to this particular show that is called Fertility Friday for a reason. <laughs> and so there are certain diets that are really great for certain conditions and for certain periods of your life, but are not necessarily the best diet for fertility when you're specifically trying to like maximize your nutrient content. Because I, as I always say, like there's no scenario where you go into pregnancy and come out like with more nutrition. The only thing that happens when you get pregnant is like a decrease in your nutrient stores because you have to build a baby. And so the question is like, what does it take to build a baby? And is the diet that I'm eating, is it going to help me to build a baby, but not just to build a baby to make sure that once I have the baby that I'm okay afterwards as well, that I'm not extra depleted. So I think that is, with respect to this conversation, I think I want to kind of, I always want to talk about it with whenever I talk about diet, especially when the topic of vegetarian vegan diets come up. The question that I have isn't whether or not this diet is good or bad or whatever. The question I have is really, is it the diet that we, sh is it an optimal diet for at this particular period of your life? If you're trying to have babies or if you're trying to, you know, sort your menstrual cycle out, like, is it ideal for right now. And ultimately, every woman has to answer that for herself because I can't answer that for you. And so I just want to thank you for taking some time to listen to the podcast. I really appreciate you for sharing the show with your friends, for supporting the Fertility Friday community. If you haven't had a chance to download your copy of my free three-part video series all about fertility awareness charting and basically taking you through the three main fertile signs and introducing the concept of body literacy. So charting your cycles, not only for birth control or trying to conceive, but also as a way to connect you with your overall health. So for more information, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam 101. So if you haven't got your free copy, you'll definitely want to pick that up. So fertilityfriday.com slash FAM101. And I just want to thank you for spending some time with me today. And so as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. Mm -hmm.